Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you have given us. We thank you for your love to us. And uh, Lord, as we open your word this morning, may our hearts be inspired and filled with your presence. May we have a sense of what it means to be a true follower of you today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. My message today is entitled, Come Be a Fool as Well. If you have your Bibles, open them with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Seems I've imagined him all of my life as the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to men, he must have seemed out of his mind. For even his family said he was mad, and the priests said it demons to blame. But God in the form of this angry young man could not have seemed perfectly sane. When we in our foolishness thought we were wise, he played the fool, and he opened our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. So we follow God's own fool, for only the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable and come be a fool as well. So come lose your life for a carpenter's son, for a madman who died for a dream, and you'll have the faith his first followers had, and you'll feel the weight of the beam. So surrender the hunger to say you must know. Have the courage to say, I believe, for the power of paradox opens your eyes and blinds those who say they can see. So we follow God's own fool, for only the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable, and come, be a fool as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 10, We are fools for Christ's sake. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What is a fool? One definition of a fool is to appear lacking in good sense. And the key word I want to emphasize this morning is appear. It also means to seemingly act ridiculous. The key word this morning is seemingly. Noah was a fool. He was an absolute fool. He heard voices in his head telling him to build a boat. Of course, it had never rained before. Imagine what his friends thought. What's gotten into Noah? Maybe he's suffering from LMC, low marble count. Quit his job. Bet the farm on the boat project. Got his kids involved in building the thing. Emptied his bank accounts, hiring contractors and carpenters. Became the laughing stock of his generation, the butt of every joke. Talk about a conspiracy theory. He was saying that the whole world was going to be destroyed by a great deluge. And he didn't have one shred of hard evidence to back it up. The scientists said it couldn't happen. It was impossible, they said, according to the laws of nature. If Noah was right, there would be at least some of the wise, great minds that would agree with him, wouldn't there be? Shouldn't the the scientists like Einstein and Hawking, or the inventors like Elon Musk, or the religious leaders like Billy Graham, but no one of prominence agreed with Noah? Patriarchy Prophets tells us in page 103, when the great and wise men had proved to their satisfaction that it was impossible for the world to be destroyed by water, when all regarded Noah's prophecy as a delusion and looked upon him as a fanatic, then it was that God's time had come 
with all their boasted philosophy, men found too late that their wisdom was what? Foolishness. Noah was a fool. He believed the unbelievable. He was a fool for God. Abram. Abram was wealthy, living comfortably in Mesopotamia. He had everything he wanted. Beautiful wife, flocks and herds. But then God spoke to him, telling him to pack it all up and leave on a journey to a place he didn't know where. Have you ever left on a trip not knowing where you were going? But all God said was this, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Abram was a fool. In fact, he was so foolish that he became one of the greatest examples of faith in all the Bible. Of course, his name was changed to Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Faith, the Bible says, is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Patriarchs and Prophets, again, page 126, relying upon the divine promise without the least outward assurance of its fulfillment. He abandoned home and kindred and native land and went forth, he knew not whither, to follow where God should lead. Yes, Abraham, according to rational standards, was a complete fool. There's a pattern emerging here. Fools for God live their lives based on God's reality instead of this earth's reality. God's fools are great men and women of faith. They base their lives not on the opinions of men, not on the expectations of society, but on the word of God. They live their lives as if what God says is reality. They believe the unbelievable. Their actions indicate that their lives are driven by that which is not seen. Fools they are. Great people of faith are always foolish. If you read through Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter, you will discover that all these faithful individuals were fools according to the society in which they lived. Take, for example, Sarah, 90 years old, and shopping for maternity clothes. Utter foolishness. Walking around Jericho for seven days in a row, blowing on a shofar. Foolishness. But the greatest example of faith and foolishness, according to this world's standard, is Jesus. In the words of Michael Card, it seems I've imagined him all of my life as the wisest of all of mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to men, he must have seemed out of his mind. For even his family said he was mad, and the priest said a demon's to blame. But God in the form of this angry young man could not have seemed perfectly sane. I don't want to be sacrilegious here this morning, but Jesus was considered to be out of his mind. He thought he was God. He had a Messiah complex. Even Jesus' birth situation was held in derision. Miraculous conception? An angel? You mean Joseph the angel, right? Jesus' own family rejected him. His brothers, this is John chapter 7, his brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea. For even his brothers did not believe in him. In Mark chapter 3, verse 21, we read, But when his own people heard about this, they went out and laid hold of him, for they said, what did they say? He's out of his mind. Jesus was the greatest example of God's wisdom, which is foolishness to man. And God chooses some weird symbols too. God chose a cross. Now, the cross proclaims a very specific message, and we use such sacred, awe-inspiring language to describe it. We sing songs like, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. We sing songs like, Jesus keep me near the cross. They're a precious fountain. But the cross was a method that the Romans used for executing the worst criminals, the thieves, 
the rogues, the political insurrectionists, people like who were seeking to overthrow the empire. Those kind of people were crucified. And remember, Jesus did claim to be a king. It was a horrible death. It was a public death. It was a gruesome death. It wasn't a symbol of victory. It wasn't a symbol of wonderment. Let me try to explain. For our generation, the cross is a symbol of healing and life. But that's not what it meant to that generation. Imagine for a moment. Humor me for a moment. Imagine that I arrived back from Africa. And I tell you that an African peasant by the name of Kojo Bayabakabu died for your sins when he was electrocuted on the electric chair. And I've even written a hymn. Kojo was there on the horrible chair. They tied him down with bolts and zapped him with 40,000 volts. It was for you that Kojo fried and died. Despite the fact his hair caught on fire, he is the Messiah we admire. He is my savior and lamp because he absorbed every deadly amp. Now I know that God does care because he sent me, he sent him to the electric chair. Now you know why I don't write poetry. But imagine if the electric chair was engraved on my songbook and it dangled from a chain in my rearview mirror on my car. And I had other hymns too, like, I will cling to the old electric chair and exchange it someday. You'd probably think I had the most crazy religion that you'd ever heard of. Imagine what the cross meant to that generation. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block because messiahs don't die, and certainly not this way, maybe in a, in a battle with the Romans, but not, not like that, in agony on a cross. To the Jews, someone who hung on a cross was cursed by God. It was a hateful thing. And to the Gentiles, the cross wasn't any more palatable. It was foolishness. You don't win by losing. You don't gain life by dying. The Greeks laughed at the story of a crucified Savior and despised the apostles' way of telling it. What? Hope to be saved by somebody who couldn't save himself? Ridiculous. And trust in one who is condemned and crucified as a criminal? Foolishness. But Paul says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the, the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Great men and women of God, those who were heroes of faith didn't dance to the tune of culture. They didn't try to fit in. They stuck out like a lone tree on the open prairie. They were ridiculed and rejected and held in contempt. Whether it was Noah building the ark, Abraham wandering the countryside, Daniel praying to God in the open window, their one aim was to be faithful to God. The gospel is foolishness. It is countercultural. It doesn't make sense. Let's just admit it. The reality is, is that genuine, fully absorbed, all in Christianity is countercultural. It doesn't make sense to the secular mind. In fact, it is in direct opposition to the values of this sinful, fallen world. Now, there are those who try to make the gospel more palatable, more acceptable. The modern gospel is that God really doesn't want anybody to change. He doesn't expect anybody to change. Just keep living the way you are. Do we see this today? Sure we do. There are churches, by the way, that are shying away from the more offensive biblical subjects. They don't want to appear foolish in an enlightened age. They don't talk about Christian standards anymore. Sin is not called by its right name. People have always wanted a God who will place his stamp of approval on the way that they are living their lives. And they have come up with all sorts of euphemisms to make it sound all right. What used to be called living in sin is now called a meaningful relationship. What used to be called killing the unborn is called the right to choose. There are churches today that don't even talk about the cross because from the cross God speaks to men and women, I don't approve 
of the way you are living. I don't like your sin. Your sin is horrible. So evil that I had to go to the cross and suffer for it. I believe that if we really take God and the Bible and Christianity seriously, we should be considered foolish according to the world in which we live. People might think that I belong to a cult. Ever heard that? Friends, it doesn't matter what people think. One day the tables will be turned. It doesn't matter what people think because one day all the wisdom of the world will be foolishness. Come to think of it, who is really the foolish one? Was it really Noah? When the storm clouds gathered and the muttering of thunder could be heard and huge drops of rain began to fall, who was the fool? And when once again the clouds gather and the lightning flashes from the east to the west and the sign of the Son of Man is seen in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he's coming again, who's the fool then? Jesus said, this is Matthew 24 and verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. On that day, the simplest child of God who is ready to meet Jesus, they may not have a PhD. Well, they might not have even finished high school. They will be wiser than the college professor who mocked at the idea of a recent creation, who ridiculed those simple-minded people who believe that God created the earth out of nothing. Stop. Stop. Stop trying to look sane. Great men and women of history have always dared to be different, have always been willing to look foolish because they live their lives according to an unseen reality. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As I was preparing this message, I, uh, I ran across the lyrics to an old song. I'd never heard the song before. It was from the 1960s, way before my time. And the lyrics were typical, romantic, secular. You get the idea. But sometimes in the midst of the most meaningless, shallow material, a deep, meaningful expression emerges. These words are written by Jack Keller. Everybody's somebody's fool. You didn't hear me, did you? Everybody's somebody's fool. And if you think about it, it's true. Everybody's somebody's fool. There are a lot of fools out there, all the way from base jumping to car surfing to experimenting with drugs. It seems that this world has no shortage of people who are willing to push the limits on what is possible. There are those who do extreme stunts, egged on by television shows and YouTube videos, peer pressure. Many people imitate the dangerous stuff they see out there. Others will play dangerous games like the choking games, the choking game where teens will choke one another until they pass out, or they'll punch one another until they bleed. There's no shortage of fools around. And it's not only the teens, by the way. Many adults do foolish things too, permanently altering their bodies all the way from tattooing to ear piercing and stretching and tongue splitting and scarification. And there's normal fools too. They live on your street, hopelessly in debt, 40, 50, 60, $70,000 in debt, just to keep up with society's expectations. I think it's true. Everybody's somebody's fool. But whose fool are you? Noah was a fool for God. Abraham was a fool for God. Paul was a fool for God. And Jesus and his cross, the greatest foolishness of them all. I am convinced of one thing today. This world is in desperate need of fools for God today. I wonder what a fool for God looks like in 2022. Ever wonder about that? What would a fool for God look like today? Well, I think it's someone like Noah and Abraham and Paul and Jesus who is all in for God. 
100% committed. Not perfect, only Jesus was perfect, but 100% committed, undivided in their loyalty to God. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Fools for God are undivided in their loyalty to God. Think of Daniel praying in front of the open window. Fools for God are unreasonably loyal to God. From the pen of a Christian author of the 19th century, I read these words. It is better to die than to sin. Better to want than to defraud. Better to hunger than to lie. Number two, a fool for God is someone who doesn't allow society's pressures and expectations to impact, interrupt, or shape their relationship with God. In other words, they don't care what other people think. When God called Jeremiah, he knew the natural tendency of the human heart to worry about what other people would think and how they would react. So he said, this is Jeremiah 1 verse 8, Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Oh, when will we start trying to please God instead of please others? If people can be fools for the devil, mutilating their flesh and tattooing their faces almost beyond recognition, why can't we be fools for God and dress modestly and appropriately as Christians should? If people can be fools surfing on cars, wheelies on sport bikes at 80 miles per hour, standing on the handlebars, where are the fools who are willing to risk their lives as missionaries in countries where to be a Christian means to risk having your head chopped off? If people can be fools racking up debt so that they can live the perfect suburban fantasy, where are those who are willing to sacrifice financially for the sake of the gospel? Fools for God don't allow society's pressures and expectations to impact, interrupt, or shape their relationship with God. And number three, fools for God live their lives based on God's reality. Their actions indicate that their lives are driven by that which cannot be seen. What does that mean? It means that I live my life not according to this earth's reality, but according to God's reality according to eternal realities. I live my life seeing the invisible, believing the unbelievable. I live my life as if the curtain were drawn aside and I could look up into heaven and I could see God on his throne and the angels in the new Jerusalem. I live my life as if what the Bible says is a true and present reality. The world has plenty of fools, but where are the fools for Christ? My invitation this morning, my appeal is simple. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Whose fool are you?